Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Crypto Marketing Insights. Um, yeah, you've probably all heard about the Twitter hack, and if you haven't, well... Twitter was hacked. Some very high-profile accounts, uh, Barack Obama, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, they're all hacked. Uh, big brands were hacked like uh, Apple and Wendy's. Crypto accounts were hacked like Ripple and uh, various crypto uh, influencers like BitLord. It's just been, you know, it's the usual hack of send me X amount of Bitcoin or send me up to X amount of Bitcoin and I'll send you back, you know, twice as much or whatever nonsense. If we look at the actual address that's in most of the hacks, by the way, some of the hacks seem to have funny sort of spoof addresses, like the one for Kim Jong-un or a few others that are out there, the, kind of the Wendy's one, the kind of like funny addresses. If you look at the, the address themselves, uh, some kind of spoof or hoax or just gag, I don't know what. But if you look at the main address that's been collecting sort of the BTC that's you know, people are actually sending, amazingly enough, uh, you can see that at the time of this video, it's received 12.865 Bitcoin, which is a remarkably large amount of Bitcoin because the amounts being sent to the addresses are fairly small, uh, which means it's had something like 374 transactions. It's basically received hundreds of donations, whether it's, or, you know, or contribution, whatever you want to call them. Like hundreds of people have sent money to this address, totaling over 12 Bitcoin, and they've squirreled away with it. And uh, good luck getting it back, right? It's just, you know, it's Bitcoin, like unless you can find the hackers, which, you know, in theory, yeah, if you put enough resources to it, it's possible to maybe find the devices or, or not. It depends how well they were executing it <laughs> what this does for marketing of crypto is many fold like on the one hand as bad as it is um, when scams increase in their appearance what it means is you have more and more retail interest and that's why scammers are jumping into the game right because they're trying to fool more naive people who might not know as much as they should about how to secure their Bitcoin um, and how to not ever send money to a doubling scam, right? This is a very old scam. It's not new to the Bitcoin world. It's not new to the crypto world. It's not new to, you know, the online world. Doubling scams go back as far as you can imagine. They are old world scams to the core. Um, and they're very easy for people to be falling victim to because the people that tend to fall victim to them are people that tend to be pretty desperate and looking for any way to be getting free money and they see suddenly an ad pop up that says something so ridiculous it seems too good to be true to anybody who isn't thinking in panic mode uh, but right now the situation of the world is rather unusual I would say and you have things like uh, one out of every four people in the workforce out of work and when two to three people depend on every person in the workforce guess what happens um pandemonium right people can't pay their bills people are stuck people are in seriously bad conditions right now it's highly underreported despite whatever um yes there's some coverage of it but it's the situation is much worse than it is remember not every not every country is like america or wherever else in europe that they're giving people some amount of stimulus money most countries people ain't getting nothing and they're just having to fend for themselves right so that causes a huge amount of potential victims when you look at where the ads are in theory run from uh, the ads on youtube that do this kind of similar scam are coming from addresses in the philippines and all over asia and wherever it's easy for them to host scammy stuff because their hosts might not, not, not even be able to read the english pages that they that they're hosting um, they could just be hosting themselves uh, there's so many different ways that these things get approved by big ad, or ad networks like YouTube that they just allow these scam ads to run. And now these things on Twitter where these same scam ads are basically being run through hacks. It's a very easy 
sort of field for picking if you're a network of hackers or a lone hacker that just you know knows how to do this. And the other thing is people are shocked, you know, that the Twitter accounts get hacked. Well, not not really. I don't think anybody's really shocked anymore. I think it's just overplayed by that were the writers and editors of most stories. Um, maybe people that send money end up being shocked when they find out, oh, that was a hack. I think that's very noisy. Let's close that. Can you guys hear that? So, yeah, there's no real surprise that these accounts get hacked because it's Twitter. It's notorious for getting hacked. Jack Dorsey, co-founder of Twitter, has had his own account at Jack hacked at least twice that I remember. I mean, if the guy who built Twitter couldn't figure out how to secure his own account, You know, interestingly, somebody pointed out that all the can all the people involved in any kind of way uh, in politics or whatever, a lot of the American ones, somebody pointed out, seemed to all be Democrats, and they didn't notice any Republicans' accounts getting attacked. Uh, could be that could be a reverse. You know, that could be a Republican who did it to attack the Democrats, but that would seem kind of dunderheaded to go after the most obvious target because then everyone would turn their attention towards you and blame you for it. Could be somebody on the Left did it to make the right see bad. Could be somebody on the right did it. You know, you never know. I'm not going to fetch for that. I don't care. I mean, what I care about is that the hack happened and what it means for social engineering. First of all, it shows that Twitter is still an unsafe place to be on and use. So you should not use Twitter for anything serious. Second of all, people forget that many addresses and user profiles have been compromised long ago and they are available for sale right now on the dark web right the dark web what's that um it's just the internet that's under the sea if you will there's the iceberg above the sea and then there's the most of it is you know the 90 percent of it is under the, the surface of the water that's the dark web it's just where all the information is just not presented on the regular the web right the public web but it's easily available to anyone who just opens up a Brave browser, for example, and clicks the hamburger button on the right, top right side of the screen and just clicks, you know, open new screen with Tor browser. And right there, it's built into Brave. So you can just access it right away. Um, and you can easily find, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to tell you where, but <laughs> it's very easy to find, unfortunately, um, literally lists of millions of profiles of people's credit card information, profiles, identification, logins, passwords, etc. cetera. Uh, there's actually a good website that you can go to to check if you have been compromised. It's called haveibeenpwned.com. It's spelled, uh, you know, have I been and then P-W-N-E-D.com, like pwned, you know, the kind of hacker term for owned, meaning hacked. Uh, you go to that address and you can literally see if your email accounts on any you know, platform you use or your social handle or whatever has been hacked. It's really a great website. Um, I'll put it up on the uh, screen and I'll put a link in the description below so you can check it out for yourself. Uh, I would actually access it if I were you only through a VPN, of course, because um, guess what? That site is, you know, very much a target for people looking for tracking uh, who's coming to the site to see if they're looking up whether or not they've been pwned, right? So you don't want anybody looking at that site's data and then looking at the public IP address and seeing that your IP is listed and that you know you've been pwned because then you have an extra angle of attack vector coming towards you because they know you're in, you know that you know, et cetera, et cetera. So be very careful, uh, but you can use haveibeenpwned.com. It's a great utility, a great resource uh, to check out whether or not you've been pwned. Uh, and if you have been, and even if you haven't been, as a matter of safety precaution, you should regularly update your passwords, especially, especially, especially on publicly accessible sites like Twitter that are so popular and that are such easy targets for hackers to do. Um, now, of course, if you have a personal Twitter account and you don't have that many followers and, you know, whatever, and you just hand, you know, pass out messages or send out messages to your friends, uh, you know, you're not a likely target for a hack to promote a scam because you don't have many followers, etc. But that doesn't mean you're not a likely hack in any case. And they might also just decide to automatically hack as many sites that they have full credentials for just to make it harder for the people at Twitter to clean up. 
Um, and that being the case, that means that you should regularly update all your passwords, like I said, and your authentication methods. Because again, if, if your password has been hacked or if your email has been hacked, unless you secure that properly and include at least one or two extra layers like uh, 2FA authentication and then giving a password to the company to make sure that only if you use a specific, specific <laughs> password can you even discuss updating your password like you know it's like a fence around a fence um if you do that sort of thing then yeah you can hack you know then you can uh, secure your accounts properly and you should and you should update that list fairly frequently so there's services like uh i think it's one password right or maybe use Dashlane, um, or maybe use LastPass, or maybe use i mean there's so many different passwords you know the browser the ones that are built into your browser chrome browser or brave browser or Firefox browser, they all have built in, even Internet Explorer, they all have, uh, or Edge now as it's called, they all have their own built in password storing system. I highly recommend using anything but the ones built into the browser because even though, yes, in theory, Google's browser is secure, yes, in theory, Firefox is secure, yes, in theory, Brave is secure, usually password security systems are quite easy to hack because anyone who has access to your system can usually get into the browser details fairly simply. Again, I'm not going to post the exact methods here. This is not a hacking channel. I'm discussing the impact of these hacks on marketing and what you can do about it just to make sure you're secure. So use a tool like the ones I just mentioned before. Again, LastPass, Dashlane, uh, one password, anything that's an external third-party provider that has a very good password storage and updating system that you're comfortable with that meets your needs, etc. I would highly recommend using, if not that, for me personally, I like paper and pencil or remembering, um, but yeah, offline, right? Not storing the passwords online is for sure the best way uh, to prevent them being stolen online. And of course, use at least a secondary layer. 2FA is great but it can be hacked if you don't secure that properly. So make sure that the device that has the 2FA on it, like if it's your phone or whatever, is secured in addition with you calling your telecoms provider and saying if anybody ever calls to change the password on anything, they have to use the following password, right? Like I explained a little earlier. If you do that, then you can't have your 2FA account hacked as easily or at all because the person would have to know that secret password that is only used to permit the changing of passwords and other details, right? That way they can't change your phone number and then have the 2FA rerouted to their phone. That's the whole idea there, which is a fairly easy hack for people to do. You'd be surprised. So again, what does this impact on marketing? Well, again, in a way it's good because it drives more noise to the crypto space even though it's not a crypto hack. It's a Twitter hack. It's a Twitter hack. It's a Twitter hack. And it's entirely a Twitter hack that made the news, right? The ads on YouTube, apparently not newsworthy. It's okay that YouTube and Google just keep collecting money from scammers um, and they're suppressing or censoring or muting anybody who has anything interesting to say about crypto or any other thing that's not on the agenda of, you know, the platform, right? The business agenda, whatever you want to call it. Um, if you say anything against their agenda, your video, probably this one will get muted just for saying if you say anything, but that's the way it is. I don't care. So they allow the scammers on their YouTube platform and Twitter allows them to decimate user profiles and sucker money out of innocent people. Right? Why? Well, marketing impact of it is that it looks bad for crypto because it's all bitcoin related so the naive people who don't know anything about or you know people who just don't know anything about crypto will think oh another crypto scam i'm staying away from bitcoin and you'd think that twitter which likes bitcoin in theory and the square we have square by the way <laughs> square had their uh profile hacked which is kind of funny because it's a 
money service created by the co-founder of Twitter. Not a surprise that they had their account hacked. Uh, easy target and obvious target. Frankly, I was surprised Jack Dorsey's account wasn't hacked. You know, it surprised me more than the fact that Joe Biden's was. Again, the marketing impact of this is not positive in the news headline sense, but it is positive in the sense of, oh, it's another story that people will not remember the details of in another 48 hours or 72 hours or whenever that news cycle ends. And they'll just go about their day and just another story of crypto noise is in their head. And maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, but it's just more noise about crypto. So in some sense, it's actually good for crypto in that way. But in reality, in the short term of right now, of course, it's not good. Twitter took a little bit of a hit in their stock price um, overnight after market hours because uh, of the hack news and that they weren't able to immediately secure and restore everything. It's certainly not looking like a death knell. It definitely did not impact the price of Bitcoin immediately. Um, the price barely budged in any direction. They just kept doing this. What we have it, you know, is just yet again another situation where poor security measures right, ended up costing a bunch of innocent people money. Maybe those people should have known better. Maybe those people shouldn't be so naive. Maybe whatever. They're still victims of a damn crime, right? Online hacking and getting people to send you money to a fake account, in some places, that is a crime. So, you know, hacking the accounts is a crime. Putting out a message it, without permission on someone else's account is a crime in many jurisdictions. And using that message to lure people to send you money when with the promise of receiving more back is a scam that may or may not be prosecutable if they could even find who did it. It's all bad noise for the space. 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 But in its totality, noise is noise. Noise is noise. Noise is noise. People don't really pay attention to the headlines. They really don't. Like, the fact that Ripple's account got hacked, right? And Apple's account got hacked. Those are not Bitcoin, right? But people will still associate it. Ripple, they don't know what that is, but they heard there's a crypto hack and crypto and Ripple or Bitcoin. Most people have no idea what the differences are. And they won't look into the headline, you know, into the story past the headline because it's bad news and they don't want anything to do with it. Great. Which means in the future, they'll hear the name again, Ripple or Apple or, or well, Apple is not crypto, but they'll hear the name Ripple or B Bitcoin or whatever they heard. Maybe that story won't be so negative and they'll open that headline and they'll read that and they'll get introduced to a world that they didn't get introduced to before. But they, they heard about something and maybe they'll look up that there was a scam and then they'll be like, oh no, this is terrible. But then maybe they'll look, you know, you never know what the narratives are. There's infinite possibilities of how people will on-ramp themselves into the world of crypto, which people will naturally do through time only if this stuff becomes easier to use. Until it becomes easier to use, this whole crypto space is just this bizarre little thing in the middle of the speculator's universe and most people don't want anything to do with it, you know? Yeah, they, they, they've heard you can make a lot of money, but you can also lose a lot of money. They've heard only bad people use it. That was years ago. Then they've heard uh, everybody's into it, including the big banks uh, and the wealthy people and the universities and all the endowments and all this and that and the other thing. So now they think, oh, it's too expensive to get into. And then they heard it just keeps crashing and it's volatile. And then they heard it's uh, stable and it doesn't move at all. It's not worth anything. So there's all negative narratives being presented to regular folks, regular folks, regular folks, not in crypto yet, and giving them great excuses why they shouldn't get into what has effectively been a, an amazing gold mine for the past 10 years for people who got in early and who people who are still getting in. Because as we saw just in the last week, you have these crazy runs with altcoins, uh, where even if Bitcoin's basically doing this the whole time, uh, or is it that direction? I don't know on the screen. But, uh, you know, when basically it's, it's, it's flatlining, um, and you got all coins like Chainlink, and you got all coins like Tezos, and you got all coins like Ripple even that made, you know, decent moves. But like Chainlink, obviously, and the Tezos, you know, they did fantastically well in the last couple of weeks. Uh, there was another one as well. Was it? Aug not, not Augur. Aurora? Anyway, uh, you know, there's been a nice run on some altcoins, and people have made quite a bit of money on it. 
Dogecoin, you know, with that ridiculous pump scheme on uh, TikTok. I mean, these ways of reaching more people at once, you know, you send out a message on TikTok and suddenly it's potentially going to reach hundreds of millions of people that are in the right demographic to be looking at altcoins and maybe Bitcoin. That's what happened. That's how the price pumped, right? It was, it was a social media pump through Binance. You know, they're like, you know, they went, a lot of them went onto Binance to buy a bunch of Dogecoin just to pump it. And it pumped. These kind of things will keep happening for as long as there are people with access to networks and the ability to hack things. One of the easiest ways that this can be solved is a system like Twitter could decentralize a lot of its um, situation, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be decentralized at, without, you know, beyond the company borders, but they can literally decentralize internally the system, okay? Um, to secure passwords and other basic measures like we spoke about could be sort of more rigorously encouraged and even gamified by the products themselves, right? There could be an incentive for changing your password on a regular basis. And why the hell isn't there, right? Think about it. If you incentivize your users to keep their up, their passwords updated uh, on a regular basis, then you can give them a bonus, whatever it is, loyalty, reward, whatever it is, something to give them some incentive to do it. Then you have a network that is not just secured at the level of the, the back end, the system that's you know fully secured by the corporation or whatever, but you have the system actively updated on a security level by users, which really it makes it much harder for hackers because hackers, one of the easiest things they look at is the fact that people tend to use the same password over and over again on different sites and they don't update them regularly so that they know they have full access to these things for a long time. They don't even have to bother, right? Uh, they don't have to worry about it. They know if, you know if they want to, they can pretty much find a way into most users' accounts because people are just lazy inherently. Um, not in a bad, like on certain things, right? Like who the hell has time to manage all their passwords every single day? But that's why you incentivize them to do it, right? And that way you secure your network better. Anyway, I know I've gone on about, about this quite a long time, but I wanted to bring it to the attention um, of anybody who's doing crypto marketing, like tell your engineers secure their networks. Do not allow it at any level to be hackable, right? Minimize your levels of vulnerability, minimize your attack vectors, um, encourage your users to change their information regularly by incentivizing them to do it. Um, just telling people change your password is not going to get people to change their password. If you give them some kind of point or emoticon or God knows what every time they do it or a little badge that says, you know, something not related to security, just some other random cool thing that you offer normally, give them that as a bonus, right? Um, why? Because you don't want to attract attention that they pay attention to their security. Duh. Right. Uh, you can tell them internally, hey, congratulations for being you know, awesome and this and that uh, for securing your network. But you shouldn't ever expose the fact that they're concerned about the security in any way. You should just incentivize them to do it by giving them things in other ways that are beneficial to them and more beneficial than not updating their password, which is a very simple thing to do um, in most places. So. Well, that's what I want to say. Um, I hope all of you doing crypto marketing stay safe and keep your passwords safe. Obviously, don't fall victim to these things. Dear Lord, if anybody watching this falls victim to this, I will be very upset with you. I do not approve. I will be very upset with you. I do not approve. Um, of you getting you know scammed by any of these idiots online who are handing out these doubling scams you know, left and right, putting them out on the internet. Ignore that crap. Don't ever click on those links. But if you know anybody who might fall victim to it, and if you have a network of your own, you know, tell people, hey, this crap happens and don't let it happen to you, right? I'll put out a sample of the message. Uh, you can see the address. Do not send them money, right? 
Uh, actually, in Techno Roddy, they blacked out half the address. Maybe I'll do that, or maybe I'll leave it whole like everybody else has done. I don't know. But um, it's not, yeah, screenshot or whatever. But I'm not going to put a link to it. You can certainly find it on uh, some blockchain explorer if you want or whatever, if you want to go see for yourself again, as you saw earlier in the video. And yeah, keep yourselves safe. Remember, a secure network is a more easily managed network. At the end of the day, less headaches, less stress, more productive time spent on your marketing, more productive time spent on your sales, more, more productive time spent on optimizing, you know, producing and delivering what your customers want or what your potential customers want, right? You always have to be listening and you always have to be testing and optimizing what you're producing because at the end of the day, crypto marketing is the only way you're going to expose more people in a positive way to this space. And it's the only way you're going to get your customers to buy in if you want them to buy something new or if you want them to be a repeat buyer in the space that you're creating. We are very much pioneers in this space, even though we're not in the very earliest days, 10, 11 years in is still very early. Like look at all the new projects that keep coming online. So you are, if you are marketing anything in crypto, you are very much a pioneer, you know, hats off to you for doing that. There's as many thousands of people as you might think there are in this space. It's tiny by comparison to any other space. It's really tiny, right? The real crypto marketers, not that many of us out there that are doing actually a good job and not doing crappy sort of work. Because a lot of people doing the crappy marketing. That's no doubt about that. There's an endless sea of people doing that. But the high quality stuff, we need more of it. And we need to see that include things like making sure you use security properly. Right, which is one of the great things about decentralized social platforms. They can be secured much better. Okay, I've said enough. I said I wouldn't go on too long, but look, I've already gone a long time. So thanks again, folks. And until next time, take care.